Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's good to see you, even if you're late. It's, it's great. great. We're so happy to share. <laughs> so um, it is good to see everyone in person, and, and I'm thankful for these opportunities to be more in person of the opportunity. So um, I know this is a big commitment for all of you to take your time out of your um, busy schedules to support um, gifted and talented students across the Commonwealth. So I just want to say thank you for that. I'm going to say that to you every time I see you. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, today we have, we have a packed agenda. So I'm going to go ahead and just um, jump into the purpose of the panel and um, the council, your council on the panel. Um, the State Advisory Council for Gifted and Talented Education is hereby created and attached to the Kentucky Department of Education. The council's purpose is to make recommendations regarding the provisions of services for gifted and talented students in Kentucky's education system. So um, I did forget to mention I'm stepping in for Greta Hilton. I forgot she was on the agenda, not me. She's unfortunately unable to make it. And just as a reminder, I am Veronica Sullivan. I'm the director of the division of IDEA implementation and preschool, which oversees the talented education of the state. So I'll turn it over to Misty yeah. now, or Misty or someone. Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Misty, and Misty's okay. going to go over the norms. Okay, awesome. Uh, members must speak when called on for roll call or any voting. Reminder to stay focused on the topic agenda at hand for the sake of time. Additional feedback is provided through the meeting exit slit. The secretary, Ms. Lindsay Burton, is taking notes. We appreciate her. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I will store and manage the documents. Here's an important note. Travel vouchers are submitted through email. And they are due to Katie Eden, Ms. Kathy Anderson, by December 15th. All right, and so you need to electronically send those. Let's have to be received electronically these days. So please, you know, either fill that out um, through the Excel spreadsheet or um, fill it out by hand and scan it with, with whatever is easiest for you. Just even what's me, and I'll take care of it from there. So we are now going to have the roll call of members and Dr. Roberts. Oh, do you want to call in? There's uh, agendas are on the table over there. Information's on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Just in time for roll call. Oh, okay. So Katie. Present. Denise Rush. Bradford. Lindsay Burton, present. Kim Coe, present. Randy Corbett, Lynn Huffington, present. Byron Darnell, he's going to come a little bit lighter, Dr. Hall. Mason Dyer, Anna Inklet, present. Burt Pena, present. Jessica Hastings, Philip Patch, Jean Lee. Tiffany Marshall, Brenda Barton, right here, Larry Ballinger, Julia Roberts, Kim Nettleton, Jennifer Prater. Hey, Miss Destiny, I'm proxy today. I'm Trinity Walsh, I'm proxy for Jennifer Prater. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So um, we're now going to look at the uh, meeting minutes and you've got a draft of that in your folder. You would look over that. If you've got any uh, edits or comments that you can maybe be changed. The last page under Future meetings, to change that uh, last day to today's day with meeting yeah, in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
Let's not make that big except for September 20, 2023. It's as needed. And we have a second to that motion. Second. A discussion. Anything else? All those in favor say aye. Aye. And opposed the same sign. We accept the minutes as amended. So uh, the next item on the agenda was to be Trace McCreary. We sent her differently because we had to move rooms today, but he hasn't responded and we're, we're working on that. So I think what we'll do is we'll uh, just go on to the next thing, which is yours truly giving a presentation on twice exceptional learners. And then we'll, we'll come back or I'll stop if Patrice joins us. That sound good to everybody? Oh, okay. So Stacy, can you hear me? If you can, you can. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt the meeting. Patrice is on the line and she's ready to, to oh, participate. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. I didn't see her lovely face on the That's screen. okay. So, no problem. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All right. So Patrice McCreary is a um, member of the Kentucky Board of Education, and they are seeking feedback on the commissioner uh, selection process. So Patrice, I'm going to turn it on over to you. Can you hear me, Patrice? Stacy, we don't see her in the room still. OK, give just a second because I just talked to her. OK, no problem. So while we're waiting, let me tell you, Patrice was Kentucky Teacher of the Year at one time, and it's just an outstanding educator who I would be very happy to be speaking for us on the Kentucky Board of Education. Oh, I don't know if y'all are. Oh, there she is. Preschool teacher. No, kindergarten teacher. So Patrice, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Patrice, can you unmute yourself? I can. You all look so wonderful. I just felt like I was right there with you. So um, that dead gum mute button. Yes, yes. We need a t-shirt that says you're on mute. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Kathy Anderson. I'm one of the facilitators for the, for the advisory council. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you all. Um, such a distinguished group. Oh, my goodness. Um, just going over your membership list is a, a litany of um, the most amazing voices in education. So thank you so much for what you do on behalf of the board. I say you are appreciated beyond measure on the students of the Commonwealth, even more so appreciated uh, from, for, for their benefit. So thank you for what you do. As you all know, these are some interesting times in education for the Commonwealth. We are in the process of searching for a new commissioner of education. And Chair Robinson of the board, the, the KBE, has requested that board members reach out to advisory groups and attend one of your meetings to gather feedback regarding the search for a new commissioner. In other words, we want your voice. We want you to be heard on who our selection will be for our next Commissioner of Education. And today is your turn to share that information. I want you to be open. I want you to be honest. I want you to feel comfortable. Um, Stacy is with us today, and she is going to assist by taking notes for us. Thank you, Stacy. Um, we intend to take this information and share that information with the search firm 
and request that they synthesize all of the information that we've gathered to help to help create and inform that candidate profile. So here is your opportunity to share what you are interested in for the qualities of our future commissioner of education. Now, I've done this with others and with other groups, and their question has always been, are you talking about professional qualities or are you talking about personal qualities? And my response has been, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm ready. And uh, in my last group, they did not jump on board very quickly with uh, any responses. And I quickly told them I am a teacher of 31 and a half years and I have terrific wait time. So um, I will patiently wait and eagerly anticipate uh, your responses. Question number one, and there are just two. What are some qualities you'd like in Kentucky's next commissioner? Patrice, this is Julia. So Hi, I'll, Julia. I'll, I'll start out. I so want the next commissioner to be looking at the wide range of learners. So much today, as I hear it, in schools, the focus is on getting folks to proficiency, and that is absolutely no goal at all for children who are there or beyond. Mm -hmm. And I think you know my interest in advanced learning, and we're missing the boat with that right now. We need more and more students ready to learn at it, well, who are ready to learn at advanced levels, having opportunities within their schools to do so. I agree That's with you. It's hardly a surprise for me, is it? It, it, it is not, and you will be equally as unsurprised to know that I agree totally with you. <laughs> Next. Thank you, Chair. This is Bryn Martin. Uh, I'm out of Bryn of County. I would love to see someone who, <laughs> who welcomes and embraces the parent and student voices into decision making. Yes. Um, it, uh, you know, we have a, a parent and a student on our Kentucky Board of Education as well, right? Isn't yes. that wonderful? I love yes. that. I love that. I'm Pauline Covington, and I represent middle school in, um, um, for the committee, and I am from Fayette County. Um, I think I would like to see a commissioner who um, champions the voice of the community, um, in addition to students and parents. I think it's important for um, the work to continue um, that has been done already in the past to listen to the local um, local population. I think they, in terms of um, cultural decision making, that that is very important. And I think it would be really beneficial for our Commonwealth to see to experience a um, commissioner who somehow dynamically brings together our Commonwealth to champion education period, to make it stellar, to make everyone excited about education, um, a revolutionary. Good morning. My name is Kirk Haynes. I represent local school board members, but my 
work is a public school teacher. I would like for our next commissioner to have uh, similar uh, experiences that our administrators have. So a minimum of three years of public school teaching experience in the classroom. <clears throat> These are great. Keep going. Patrice, I'm uh, Trinity Walsh from CPE. And um, I know that one of the priorities we have is that um, the new commissioner continues to champion the Commonwealth Education Continuum and that we continue to do the work from P to 20 um, and that we're looking at education as not ending at grade 12, but continuing beyond um, high school into post-secondary education, whatever that looks like for students, as well as um, just like um, Dr. Robert said, continuing to push for that advanced coursework. So um, early post-secondary opportunities for our students, um, including dual credit. opportunities. This is not a shy group. I know that they're going to talk. <laughs> well, I'll say something. Hi, my name is Hannah England, and I'm a gifted and talented coordinator for Russell County, which is a small rural area of South Central Kentucky. Um, and to be honest, I don't even know how to completely word this without everyone kind of being like, yeah, I'm sure that the commissioner already does that. <laughs> but um, being kind of in the front lines at the schools, um, I would just like the commissioner to really put a focus on uh, the whole child, not just test scores, not just test data driven. I know that is important, but even with our gifted and talented hats on, we have an opportunity to look at students under special considerations. Um, and for us, that allows us that even though the test score wasn't maybe where it needed to be, we were able to look at the whole child to see if potential is there. And I know it is at a rural setting, uh, we might not have a lot of the opportunities and the potential that uh, maybe Lexington, Bay County or Jefferson County may have. Um, so I, I would like, I guess, to, you know, fight for the underdog, the, the little guy, but to just to kind of think about education as a whole child and not just data driven to, to really to encompass the um, what their home life looks like, the the cards that they have been dealt, um, the, what they are going through. So I don't really know how to word that, but but whole child focus, I guess, instead of just solely on test and data driven. Because we're certainly not a, a one size fits all, are we? <laughs> yes, yes. This is Pauline Covington again. I'm going to go ahead and share another ideal um, and to help narrow the excellence gap, I would like to see universal preschool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I may or may not have been shouting that from the rooftops for four, almost four years now on the board. <laughs> but, uh, w they're in agreement with me. So, yeah. As a former kindergarten teacher. <laughs> Fred Mark again. I'm, sorry, I'm trying to make sure everybody else have a chance to to say what they want to say. So uh, I'm loving I'm loving your responses. I'm loving it. <laughs> good, good. Yes, I, I definitely think we need more. Uh, I don't want to say more, but uh, to make sure that we have that focus on. Uh, eliminating the gaps and understanding some of the challenges that people in the families are dealing with outside of the classrooms, as well as what the teachers are bringing to the classroom. So uh, more understanding, more uh, empathy, opportunities for empathy, as well as support uh, for mental health and so forth. So now than ever before, right? I'm going to go ahead and continue because not many times do I have an opportunity to not fill out a survey 
and just speak my mind. So thank you, Patrice, for this. Um, so, I think so as, glad a, you do. As, a, as a teacher in middle school, um, I would love to be supported by a commissioner who encourages, celebrates, and continues to feed the educator pipeline and not just any educator, but one that is prepared um, academically, so uh, emotionally, socially, and understands what culturally responsive teaching looks like. Um, I would like to see a teacher or a commissioner who, again, is so revolutionary in that they somehow fix our um, our gaps in in the post education post secondary um, enrollment for educate for future educators. I I'm dreaming big, so I would love That's to see candidates that can that have that zeal, that have that hope, that that we can we can be at the top in this nation and in the world. If you don't dream big, you don't get big results. So it, it, we always need to dream big. This is Brent again. I would also like to see someone who really knows how to um, not really with a partisan hand and really focus on what's best for the students uh, as well as the teachers and, and really try to look at them individually and understand them. I, I'm sorry, you brought you you broke up at the very beginning. I I apologize. Could you start that again for me, okay. please? Yes, someone who is uh, not led by their partisan views. Got you. And and then you went on to say, oh, uh, just for example, they're focusing on what's important to the students and to the families, to the teachers, and looking at them as individuals and really trying to understand what they're seeking and understanding uh, and open and having openness for education um, as opposed to wanting to like ban books, I guess. I, I don't know if that's a part of topic these days, but uh, but someone who is open and willing to take risks on, on leaving it open so that every person can have a whole need um, based upon their uh, culture or, you know, their learning needs and not have it shut down because uh, maybe the public disagrees. So willing to take some risks, some risks on what they think is right. Thank you for, for repeating so that I could, I want to make sure I get everything. Uh, we, we get everything. I hope I was thank, clear. You. thank you. Yes. Teresa, yes. I have two things. One, I want the new commissioner to celebrate teaching uh, and to make sure that message is spread far and wide. And the other message that I want to be spread far and wide is that every child comes to school to learn every day. And for the home and the only way for that to happen for our most advanced students is to make some decisions that will allow advanced coursework to be in place. And all we have to do is look at data to say that's not happening at least not happening far and wide in Kentucky. Let's do it. Let's do it. I, I, I hope you're following along with the board and our vision for the future and uh, opening up opportunities and, and, and all with what our United We Learn, we're working toward. Uh, there's some exciting conversation there and it's beginning to gel. Um, so I don't want to close this question. If you still would like to respond, so. Um, Ms. McCrary, this is Kirk yes. Haynes uh, yes. representing local school boards. 
Yes. I would like two characteristics or two qualities in our next commissioner. One is uh, varying levels of <laughs> advocacy and uh, working with uh, governance bodies, uh, experience at a local level, a state level, and someone who has some experience working with our federal legislators. And my second request is a commissioner who has a very deep understanding of school finance and a specific working knowledge of Kentucky's SEEK formula, property, evaluate, property evaluations. All of these are wonderful ideas. And my job is to be a teacher, but I represent local school boards. So yes. you need money to do a lot of these things. Yeah, you all you all get to roll around in the the funding a lot as a local school board member. So I understand that concern. <laughs> Can I add to maybe someone who's committed to the um, free lunch and free breakfast concept? This is Harry Ballinger from Rock Nestle County Schools. It's great to see you again. It was wonderful um, to see you virtually. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, instead of sitting by each other. Um, I, I, I would love to be there. I would love to be there. <laughs> I'm representing our Kentucky superintendents, and, and I really think that it's important that our next commissioner have experience in the Kentucky public school setting, whether that's administrative experience or superintendent experience. Um, I think the learning curve is often very difficult to come in from outside of Kentucky public school experience. And we need someone who understands um, our state and understands the work that the board is already doing and that can, can jump right in and go with the work that we have already initiated. I think, that's, I think that that would be very valuable to districts all over to the state to know that it's one of our own. Sorry, yeah. this is uh, Katie Booth. I work with high school students, um, and I think this just sort of reiterates that idea. I would love to see somebody who has a deep commitment to our Commonwealth. Um, educational change is often slow, but it, I think it can be steady if we have somebody who has a real commitment to our state, our students, our teachers. So I'd love to see someone who understands our state and wants to kind of be in for the long haul so that they can really oversee change that hopefully would be steady, but might take a number of years to really realize. This group of all groups understands the importance of meeting the needs of a diverse population. Um, so our commissioner will have one of the most diverse states, the Commonwealth of Kentucky is an incredibly diverse state from east to west, north to south. As someone who recognized the importance of more resources or at least allocation of staff and, uh, to support all of the GTE programs. So the KDE staff? Uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking at, at each district, like some districts might have one person uh, to handle all the GTE students. So, yeah, so to, to better uh, spread that out with staff or figure out a way to juggle staff. But you need more than one person, I think, in some of these big areas. Patrice, I think I'll, this Joy, yeah, I think I'll follow up on what Bram was saying. We need a commissioner who will share information that we have gifted and talented children. I encounter so many teachers who've never heard of it and they've been in the field a long time. So how, how do we get the word out that a GSSP 
is an individual education plan? How do we get buy-in that it's important to support multiple ways to accelerate children to address their learning needs? It just is not a priority currently, and folks certainly won't act if they don't even know what to act on. To develop that understanding that uh, children are gifted 100% of the time, not just one hour a week or 45 minutes a week, right? Oh, that's right, or even at all. Right. Yeah. These, these are wonderful. Uh, you are my people. <laughs> Uh, just just to let you know, I, uh, I'm i proud to say I walked the talk in the classroom. Um, it's no accident that I've joined you all to glean your input because um, this is our gifted students across the Commonwealth are very important to me. So. Unless we, we have, have another question too. We can, we can. Um, can we, there it is. What should the new commissioner focus on in their first year? You know, this is going to be a transition period, no matter what, some form of a tr transition will take place. Um, not everything can happen spontaneously. Um, for a new commissioner, but what would you like to see the commissioner focus on in the first year? So this may be even pulling in our previous discussion into a laser focus right here. This is tougher, isn't it? Again, hello with Russell County, but um, and this might not be feasible, but I, I just think how connections with staff is so important and just personal connections. So I just think the first year, a lot in time in their schedule to actually get to focus, like focus on each district at some point. And that, that might not be feasible, I don't know, but just to know, um, or whether that's a visit or a call to the superintendent or a shout out, something to say, hey, I see you, I hear you, I, I know you, and I want to work with you. But I just think really taking and making that emphasis on building that those relationships so that the school districts can trust that they are going to fight for them and be an advocate. So I, I think the relationship building is very important. I agree. This is Pauline Covington again from Bay County. I would like to also see that the new commissioner for their first year uh, honor and respect the work that the Kentucky Board has done through United We Learn. I, I think there was a lot of time and effort and resources um, used, dedicated for that initiative. And I think it's a robust plan, and I really, I, I expect that the commissioner respect that, um, that plan. I agree. <laughs> I think it's Julia. I think messaging that I talked about in the first question could be very important for setting the stage for this year that every child is to learn every day in school. Because if we are doing that, we're pre-assessing and we know what students already know and we're letting them make continuous progress. No one should be against that. That should be our battle cry. Every day, every child learn. 
And I think during the first year, he can celebrate teaching. Uh, we're in dire need of doing that across the country mm -hmm. and certainly within Kentucky. You can't continue to believe teachers. No, we should never have done it. And maybe make it clear what a, a quality teacher is. I think at one point there was something called uh, the, the quality. There was some way of, of uh, streamlining and, and giving people a chance to focus on what characteristics make a high quality teacher. I think that's what it's called, HQT. And uh, I'm not sure what happened to that, if everyone still adopts that. Uh, I'm sure, especially with COVID, some of those definitions have changed because so much have gotten added. We realize, oh gosh, they need so much more technology. They need so much more uh, uh, student communication skills and, and deeper learning. So I just really think we need to really be clear on what that looks like and what it doesn't. <laughs> High expectations for our students, but also, also for our teachers. <laughs> Anything uh, else to share with Patrice? Okay, with your permission. Chair Roberts, we will kind of wrap this up, but what I would like to do is um, exhibit a little reflective listening here and share back with kind of in general what I'm hearing from you all today. Everything that you have been that you have shared will be shared. Um, so just know that this is just Patrice McCrary telling you what I'm hearing from you today, but all of your individual comments will be shared. So rest assured there. Um, I just looking over the notes that I've taken. It's important to you all and none of this surprises me for this esteemed group, but it's important that we have someone who sees the whole child. Um, and by the whole child, that means their needs, mentally, socially, all the aspects that roll into that child to step into that classroom ready to learn. Their lunch, their breakfast, they're just wrapping them up with an understanding of who our children are. From the diverse needs of the western part of the county to the eastern, to the north, to the south, and that they are more than a number more than a test score and they have great potential each child has potential and it's our job to set the stage the commissioner's job to help prepare the stage for helping every child every day reach that their own potential um someone who is a champion for the community and their input into the importance of the education system. Listening to those community members, listening to the teachers. Um, I, I, I felt a lot of that coming across from you all, having that listening ear, truly, truly hearing, not just having you speak, but truly hearing what everyone has to say and taking it to heart. Um, beyond proficiency, beyond proficiency, beyond proficiency, we have not met the needs of our children who are already scoring distinguished, celebrating that and not moving forward from that point. So, we need to forget about sitting on our laurels that we have those distinguished students and instead take them even further. And a commissioner needs to understand the importance of that and the importance of having an innovative educational system where we meet the needs of our kids. Um, 
ding, 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 universal preschool so that every child has equal opportunities to step into the classroom on a more equipped, a more prepared, um, a more equitable, equitable uh, standing. Yes, yes, yes. Um, trying to, I'm trying to um, pull together your comments. Um, oh, the teaching profession that has taken quite a black eye in recent years. Um, instead, turning it around and making it a celebration of who our teachers are, what they're doing, uh, and making sure that what they are doing is of the highest quality and what our expectations are, that commissioner is showing what our expectations are of the teacher in the classroom. Um, helping people understand that mediocrity is not total success. It is not success. Mediocrity is not success. Um, striving for excellence uh, in our teaching field and in our students. Every child, every day should be able to have the opportunity to learn. Every child, every day. And I'm going to go ahead and say um, my teaching philosophy was probably the most complex but simplest one you will ever find. And it was every child can and will learn with joy. So I'm going to go ahead and jump out there and say that they would learn with joy in an atmosphere of celebration of learning. Um, someone who is an advocate, they're an advocate for communities, for our teachers, for our students, with government bodies. And yes, all the way up to the federal level federal level, because we know that legislators determine what we teach, practically when we teach it, how we teach it, and sometimes to whom we teach it. So um, that, that communication with our legislators and those relationships. Um, simple facts such as, not simple, not so simple, heavens I know, I, I deal with it too, school finance. Um, understanding those seat funds and the importance of where they need to go. For heaven's sake, we need to champion for transportation funding <laughs> and so many more things in that seat funding. So having a very deep understanding of what our local districts face day in and day out for um, the funding or the lack of funding that they have. Um, and then something that we're hearing a lot of, um, Kentucky experience, because as I mentioned earlier, we are a most diverse commonwealth, and um, a lot of the advisory committees are saying someone who knows Kentucky is critical for us. Um, and then boosting, celebrating, more than just acknowledging, uh, but putting out at the forefront all about our gifted and talented program and the needs we have, the staffing needs we have, the training that we need. Um, one of the most um, disconcerting things that has happened within our Commonwealth was when professional development uh, monies was uh, uh, the, the monies were taken away and um, our individualization of professional development was changed because that was the time when we had the opportunity to learn how to better meet the needs of our students. So someone who will be a champion for um, our gifted and talented students for their special needs and, and an understanding an understanding of our gifted and talented students. Does that capture question number one, do you think? Anything I need? If I had to defend your responses today. 
think you have it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay. And that might also answer question number two. It and it does. And and I'm I'm glad you prefaced this response by that because it's all there. You've got it all there. Um number two, you pretty much wrapped it up with a bow. Um because um the the um the one thing I think that maybe is a little bit added is um, to continue the good that we are doing in the state, the vision that we do have to improve education and be on the cutting edge. You know, we once were, and um, our goal is to be back up there, the, to that vision of United We Learn and build toward it. Um, Communication, 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 communication comes across and building those relationships. I'd like to hang out with y'all some more. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> you are a fabulous group and I would be there in person with you had I not had another obligation until later in the evening here in Bowling Green last night. And y'all have the audacity to be sitting in early time not central time. <laughs> Please know that I am on the KDE site. All the board members, our email addresses are listed there. We're a quick contact away. Please don't hesitate to send uh, me an email if there was something that you would have loved to have said, but either you didn't I uh, want to say it out loud, which I don't think this was a shy group. You make me so proud as a, as a teacher. You make me so proud. Um, or if something just comes up and you would like to share, you still have time. We are still in the process of searching for our, our uh, search team. So uh, we still have time to gather this information. Uh, if nobody has told you today, that you are appreciated, you are appreciated. So now you have been told, wrap your heart around that and continue your good work. And thank you so much for letting me spend some time with you. I'm better for it today. Thank you so much, thank Patrice. You. We've enjoyed our conversation together. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, Julia, I'm happy to do lunch anytime. I'm looking forward to it <laughs> soon. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Well, thank you so much for all those remarks and thoughts. Um, I think we're going to take a quick break now. I've got about 1056 on my clock, so you will need like a five-minute break or a ten-minute break. How long you got? Uh, five minutes. Why don't we come back then uh, at 1101 then? That'll give us five minutes. Stretch the legs. Yes. Can I take a minute just to applaud everybody's ideas? I thought everybody. Thank you. Just imagine, this is just one group. Imagine all the others. So if you just listen, and then go forward, but encouraging you to go this down here. Have you come out tonight? I just want to take today off, and I'm glad I'm sure you're 
Yes, we had just I mean, uh, Russell County. Yeah. So, so there's like a wrestler. It was a wrestler. It was a It was a wrestler. And maybe it's just an email or just a touch base. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we want. Because there's such a disconnect, at least from yeah. my my perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't even know if people know this exists. <laughs> yes. That's and I thought mm -hmm. yeah, I wasn't someone had mentioned it out like just like yes. So much like my, my sister was a fourth grade teacher mm -hmm. and she got a new job in like September as like a curriculum coach. So she left the classroom and she's loving it. Um, but they hired someone to come in. So it's a six year. No, is that the right? Were they the six option? Option six? Oh, option six. That's yeah. what I did. Option six. Yeah. 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 But like, did you have do it teaching or anything? Oh, yeah, I had to. And that's what it was a concurrent with my it was concurrent with my academics though okay so like i in order for me to be hired by fayette county i had to enroll so, yeah i had to physically i mean i had to put up some money that's, that's what i i didn't understand because they at first her replacement they hired this lady and i was so sweet so willing so you know but my sister was kind of, she was kind of going to help her. Like, she never got student teaching. She didn't. And she's not in the, she what? Oh, oh. Yeah. And she's in the class. She's, she's a teacher now. Oh. But she never got student teaching. We're going to get it, look at her lesson plan. And it was like, oh, well, how many students do you have to buy these? And she was like, I need these. Yeah. And you're kind of like, yeah. I mean, she should be great. I mean, like, I think with just, it looks struck me and she's enrolled in that program she she graduated somehow with the like two you know two years of education classes oh but she never had the experience oh yeah i i guess i, I did have it yeah i did i did not yeah. Yeah. yeah so see so like yeah, that's what i thought that's that's the only thing it's so dry and don't see any of things are such a Yeah. A warm, willing body. Is that what they're like? I think so. Where they have the resources. And it's and I'm not trying to put blame on anybody, but I just think it's not an issue with us. They're just getting to the point where they're like, and I mean, I don't know if it's somebody, but it's a nobody. Yes. And this lady is very receptive to Chris, like, she'll do great. Well, and but we also want to make sure she has a support. Yes. 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 And that's something else, too. I think that takes like, it's better than we yeah, yeah. You know, they used to, I don't know when you went there, they did the K2. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that was like so the last year. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. But I thought it was a necessary yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. how you put that? Yeah. Because yeah. that is true. Yeah. Because yeah. it's like, it's okay. no one wanted to see first year teaching, you know, but it kept you in, like, I mean, I agree with it. Yes. I was so proud to finish it. They took that away. Like, there's nothing. And I'm just like, what is it for the like, it's for the teacher. And like I said, for some kind of fun that. That's one of the classes. position. Like, they had one pretty coach for the elementary, but she said, they said, oh, we need another okay. one. And that was part of her job, I think, is to kind of like to help these new teachers. Oh, it's the um, So I was happy to hear that. Yeah. But yeah. Awesome. I was just kind of shocked that they put the Japanese with uh, just 
Relationship building is exactly what I would well, did everybody get a good parade? Yeah, yeah relationships to okay. so okay. yeah. okay. yeah. How far that goes? Yes. <laughs> I never I had not met her. She said joy. <laughs> I just have to like move to mix it up. Like I have a Oh, yeah. Stop like that. I don't know. 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 I don't I know it, so I, but the NADC news source came out about the uh, there was an article about I guess uh, Javits funding is on the block again with the uh, um, government shutdown deal that we're going to expect that to happen. But I will do is it's different that in that same fight. I will one is severely. Idle three is reduced. Oh, it says the post budget. You think we're all back? All right. Well, again, really appreciate all your comments. I, I know we are a verbally precocious group. 
we do not have any trouble uh, hearing our thoughts and ideas. So well, these are things we all think about all the time. So <laughs> it's kind of okay to have someone ask, what would we like to have? Right. 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 Like she said, drink this, you know. I was going to say, it's so rare, honestly. Right. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. Why it's exceptional are 2B learners. Um, one, of, uh, one of the exit slips that uh, you guys uh, filled out, this was a request to learn more about why it's exceptional students. And um, as I said before, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, when I was in the classroom and was a gifted resource teacher, I had several students that I worked with who were uh, 2E, twice exceptional. And some of them had uh, some uh, learning disabilities where maybe their uh, hands didn't process as quickly as their minds did, or maybe their, uh, their cognitive skills needed uh, kind of support. But then they also were very uh, either creative or very cognitively uh, above, you know, uh, above average students. I had some students that were uh, physically had some physical challenges with some, uh, some diseases they were born with, but still had very uh, precocious minds. So uh, just want to share a little bit with you about twice exceptional learners. Uh, this is very informal. If you all have questions, if we go along, you know, please just let me know. I'll be glad to stop and, and address those. If I, if I have the, the answer, if I don't have the answer, I'll look it up and get back to you. <laughs> So first of all, what is a twice exceptional student? So in our uh, gifted regulation in the state, we don't have a regulation or a definition for that. If we were to ever um, update our regulation, I think that's something we would like to add as a twice exceptional definition. Uh, but the term twice exceptional or 2E uh, refers to intellectually gifted children who have one or more learning disabilities such as dyslexia or ADHD or autism spectrum disorder, but they also could have gifts and talents. Uh, there are several categories uh, for uh, disability in our state, and those are uh, the ones that are listed in our uh, Kentucky administrative regulations. And so something to think about is whenever we have students in our classrooms who have these learning disabilities or these physical disabilities, they also must be considered for their gifts and talents. There are students who I said like before could be very uh, gifted cognitively or they could um, uh, also be gifted with uh, visual and performing arts or creativity or leadership. And sometimes I know that we need to focus on these students' uh, supports that they need for their IEP, but we also have to think about the support that they might need if they were identified as gifted as well. So we have uh, some sections in our regulation to address equity and to also uh, address students with disabilities. So this is this comes from uh, our gifted regulation. This is section three, subsection three, and it says a local school district shall provide a system for diagnostic screening and identification of strengths, gifted behaviors, and talents, which provide equal access for racial and ethnic minority <clears throat> children, disadvantaged children, and children with disabilities. So from the subsection, you see that we have to, schools have to have in place uh, policies and procedures to ensure that when they are screening students, that there is a process in place for equal footing for those children. So it could be they're looking at their IEP and addressing those accommodations that are in the IEP, or if they're a student that maybe hasn't been in our country for very long, maybe they have some language barriers that maybe they give them a, a nonverbal test which will be mostly pictures or puzzles, those types of things to address those students' uh, cognitive abilities. Questions about that? It's a lot to take in all at one time. It's like drinking from the hose. Right? Um, I'm sorry, just one. Go ahead, Brent. Uh, this might sound small, but uh, I know this used the word disabilities a lot. A lot of the workshops I've been going to are suggesting uh, uh, Political correct or more sensitive term. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if you had heard of some or. No, you know I work in the in the office of IDEA and, and preschool, and so that is the term that's used federally as well as in our office. Good uh, comment, though. 
And you know, Kathy, mm -hmm. you know, once they qualify with special ed, you very likely will have an individual uh, intellectual assessment. Mm -hmm. So you've got that kind of information mm -hmm. that we don't have on many gifted children. Right. Just don't have that information sometimes or not looking for that information about those students who might be creative or in the visual performing arts or leadership. And sometimes we all thought I had put on the <laughs> anyway. Um, but, but thanks for that comment, you guys. Is there anything else on that? All right, this is the second part of the regulation that pertains to students with disabilities, also our other students with maybe uh, disadvantages of some kind or uh, our underachieving students. And so this part of the re re uh, regulation comes from section four, subsection two, and it says exceptions and special considerations. And this is what Hannah was alluding to earlier when she was talking to uh, Ms. McCreary today, um, that there need to be, you need to take into there's exceptions that it can be uh, discussed with the gifted and talented selection and placement committee. Um, this is our school personnel need to take into consideration environmental, cultural, and disabling conditions, which may mask a student's true abilities that may lead to the exclusion of otherwise eligible students, such as students who qualify as exceptional child is defined in KRS 157.200. That's for the uh, categories I had on an earlier slide. Disadvantaged students, this could be students who are either disadvantaged economically or maybe culturally, and then also are underachieving students. So these are our students who there is a discrepancy uh, between what they uh, are, can achieve and what they are achieving. So there are, these are the two main sections that help us as we think about having equal opportunities for all students. I, I have a question or yeah. just maybe a well, question and suggestion. I know whenever looking at students and um, when we we test the students and we do we do look at the data. Um, in the past years, Miss Susie and I, we just kind of pull, of course, the ninth stay nine, but students who were close to the ninth stay nine and maybe eighth stay nine, and pull them into the discussion. Is there any barriers causing that? Um, and I mean, I, I know looking at we need to focus on on the whole child, but should we, like, if a kid scores on the COGA, like the fifth stay nine, like, like how, how do you decide kind of that cutoff if there is, um, like, for discussion of, of special consideration? Like, is it, like, say, if a kid's scoring, like, fourth stay nine, well, that's not even close to the not stay nine, but could a special consideration be given to that child, I guess, if the conditions were severe enough? I, I don't know. I guess my suggest like what what would you suggest? We we just right now we kind of we we do look at the whole child, but we think well if fits stay on, even if with the special consideration would that put them to the quality of a not stay on? We think yes for eight stay on because they're so close, but then I think about seven stay on, six stay on, or if you have a kid who could care less and just bombs and has a second stay on. I, I don't know. I was just kind of going to pick your brain, and maybe this isn't the place to do that, but I'm just kind of curious to see your suggestion on that. Well, I think that's why the gifted regulation is broad in some sense, you know, and it says that districts need to have policies and procedures that cover the things that are in the regulation. So those would be district decisions. Okay. And uh, based on uh, the data that you collect about the students in your community, and um, there are criteria as you know, in the regulation. And so you still need to gather all that criteria for the different uh, uh, categories, but then your GT selection placement committee, that would be the ones who would make those decisions because they're the ones who are the most familiar with the children in your schools and in your district, right? So you still have to collect, like say you're doing uh, general intellectual ability, the causes for second, oh, uh, you know, you're gonna collect, like you were saying, like cognitive ability assessment thing, but there's also been things that you can, uh, collect like a data from the students work and other assessments they do in class, you know, other high performing assessments that they have, those types of things. But you want to collect all those things that your policies and procedures in your district say that you're going to collect for that certain criteria. And then based on the discussions you have, that, those would be district decisions. Okay. okay. So I don't know if that, that answers or not, but yeah. 
If I may add, um, <clears throat> think of one of my students who just transferred into my school. Um, he had uh, um, scored maybe in the second stay nine when he was younger. But we also took into consideration because he was recommended for for our um, uh, as a visual artist to enter into our program. Um, they measured again, you know, and I think that the reading that Dr. Uh, Roberts had sent us um, talks about it not it's not one and done. You're going to continuously follow that student and continue to seek information and data. Um, to find their gifts, to find their, you know, who they are and their potential. Those are, that's, that's a good question. That's, that's a good comment that you said that we're looking continuously. And like you said, we don't just look in fourth grade and then we stop, you know, because we have students who come in from our districts, from other, other, other counties that might not have been identified. Our students grow. You know, we hope that they continue to grow. And so we're continuously looking for gifts and talents. So good comments. Let me ask us, but I, I want to make a comparison. So I need to ask a, a more foundational question. Okay. Um, when we look at proficient, uh, distinguished in those categories, mm -hmm. they don't take into account your, the student's disabilities, right? They just look at how they performed on those tests and then label them. Label the, you know, so, distinguished. Right. So, so the state test you could use that as a diagnostic type of thing, and and during those state tests, their accommodations have to be provided. So, okay. if districts are taken into account the students' individual education program needs. Okay, for accommodations. Yes. So once that's been met, right, and then they get the results, right, when they decide who's proficient, who's distinguished, they have a a, a scale for that, right. Yes, and they don't take into account whether those students were. They don't have a separate scale for the disabled students with disabilities, right? No, no. Okay, I do, I do think they should. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. I think that's part of the problem of why there are certain gaps. Uh, for example, if if you're determining a race and one person has two legs and the other person has one leg, to say that that person was behind them a meter. And so they weren't as good when that person ran all that way with one leg. I, you know, I think that should be taken into account. But the situation is now they they don't. So I just think there need to be consistency. If we don't take it into account, then when we determine giftedness, I, I think the definitions would also have to be the same, whether they have a, uh, whether they're two e or wouldn't they? Right. Uh, so that's what the gifted in town and selection committee is doing. Because when they are looking at all the evidence that's been collected, and and that is a you know a district decision about their policies and procedures, what all they're going to collect. But that's why the, the GT committee is so important because they're having conversations about that whole child, not just about the children who scored at distinguished or who scored at the night stay nine. They should be looking at all the children, doing a diagnostic search, a child find, if you will. If you're going to use bed terms, right? So they should be taking all that into account, Brent. That's a good question. Yeah. So there are three profiles of, of gifted students or possibly twice exceptional children. So the, the first profile is the just try harder profile. So uh, these are children who've been identified as gifted, but have been uh, not identified maybe as a student with a disability. And what happens is sometimes you have these children who are really high ability and for a long time it may cover up you know, the, the fact or not cover up, but it, yes. it, it masks their, their disability. So, um, like, for example, um, I, I know someone, one in my family who for a long time did okay, even though they were dyslexic until they got into say fifth grade and, and the reading comprehension got harder and those types of things. And then they discovered that my family member was dyslexic. And so here's a person who was really gifted, really, really bright, but yet uh, they needed supports to help him with, with reading and that type of thing. So these are children who may have large vocabulary, excellent verbal abilities, but maybe their handwriting is, is just, maybe they can't take down all the notes that, that the teacher is saying, or they can't uh, 
spell things, you know, of course, everybody has problems spelling. I mean, I don't know if we do that. Like, I said, I'll check. Personally, um, they're on grade level, you know, but but they might be further along if they had some supports for their for their other uh, for their other needs. And then, um, so that's profile number one. Students who's gifted, but uh, their identification for possibly a disability hasn't been detected. Then we got the just average per profile. So this is a student uh, who might be a device exceptional learner, but they're not identified for gifted or a student with a disability. And this is because their their gifted gifts and talents kind of mask or wash out their uh, disability or vice versa. And so they look like they're just an average student. So they have superior uh, intelligence, but it's compensating for maybe those undiagnosed learning disabilities. They're re receiving instruction in the general classroom, and so nobody sees that maybe they have gifts or talents. And so there's there's no support for that child. They're functioning below their potential. They could do more, but um, like I said before, there's not supports for that. Nobody's identified that student for their gifts or talents, and um, their talents may emerge in specific content areas and become noticed later in life if we're continually seeking students with. Uh, those gifts and talents, not just have that one and done and kind of philosophy or mindset. All right, and then third is the can't be gifted profile. And fortunately, I think this happens often with our students who have behavior needs. People have the misconception that children have to be good, air quotes, in order to be in the gifted program, like it's a label or it's an award, and it's not. You know, when you're identified for gifted and talented services, it's because you need those services in order to help you move forward. You may need acceleration, you may need enrichment, maybe you need both, but we definitely uh, need to be thinking about these students. And so, um, you know, more often than not, they may fail in school and are noticed because of their disability, but not because of their gifts and talents, especially if they are having some behaviors that need to be addressed in the classroom. Um, and, you know, we have students that are included in our regular classrooms, uh, but if our general classroom teachers don't understand that this is their disability, it's not because they want to have behavior where they can't control it, right? Uh, but they need supports for that. And so, uh, little bit, go ahead. Um, just a question that I wonder in, if anyone knows of any literature about it, um, is there a, is there a diagnostic for teachers to use? Basically, again, this gifted student that I that I have the honor to teach because this person is making me a better teacher. Um, what I want to know is, do teachers or is it an understanding that if there's a student who shows some sort of deficiency in terms of behavior or yes? where their behavior really is outstanding and sets them apart from the classroom, not in necessarily a more positive way. I would think, I guess in my experience, my uh, desire would be to default to in what areas is this child gifted? Because there's something that to me, it's a, it's a, a sign or a signal of, wait, this, this child's um, needs don't seem to be met. So in what areas would they would their needs be met? And if we were to address that, will we, will we discover their talent and their giftedness? And I'm wondering if there's any research or any information articles about that that y'all may know of. Yeah. Think of any right off the top of my head, although I know I have read some and could do some uh, search for you and get back to you on that. I know the National Association for Gifted Children has done several articles on, you know, gifted children and twice accepted children, what to look for, those types of things. There are other states that have information out there about twice accepted children. I've got one up on our KDE Outlook Facing website. This is kind of uh, the slides I'm sharing with you or the slides that I used at other conferences like the Kentucky Association for Gifted Education's annual conference. Um, but there are characteristics that, that you can look for, but of course there has to be that professional learning yes. that we talked about earlier that, that has to occur so that you're, you're looking for those things. For, for like you said, if you have a student that maybe has some behaviors um, 
that seem, um, you know, not very positive in your classroom? Is it because that student has an IEP for those behaviors and is getting assistance? Or is it because, you know, that student is either bored in class or not challenged in class? So, but there, there is literature and it's out there. I and mean, add to that, the Association for the Gifted is a division of the Council for Exceptional Children. And much of the focus coming out of PAG, which is what we call that organization, focuses on TUI. Um, there was a conference held in October in Cleveland. And when I say the first annual, that always sounds silly, but there'll be a second annual next year mm -hmm. in late September at the University of Cleveland that's just on TUI. There, there's a lot being done with it right now. And in spite of that, lots of the Special educators don't know anything about it. Lots of gifted educators don't know anything about it. So there's um, lots of uh, conflict that comes. We've done a study of state departments, those in charge of gifted and those in charge of special ed, and find that in some states, the gifted person doesn't know what the special ed person is, and they're saying different things about what that state requires. So we're not at a level of um, sophistication in, and that's not true in all states, but it's true in several states, which kind of tells you what the lay of the land is. Thank you. Yeah. So these are some strengths and challenges that you'll see with vice exceptional children. Or you may see, uh, like on the, on the left, you've got you know children with superior vocabulary. Uh, they may have questioning uh, characteristics where they ask a lot of questions. Uh, sometimes, if, if the educator may feel threatened by all the questions that a gifted ch child might ask, or potentially a gifted child might ask, and those are things that we need to, as high quality educators, as Brent was saying, need to understand that this may be a a child or a twice exceptional child. They have a sophisticated or witty sense of humor. Sometimes it's very dry sense of humor. It can seem kind of quirky. It just looks like roll a deck of kids rolling right. through my head. But, you know, because they are gifted or maybe gifted, sometimes they are easily frustrated by not being able to put down their thoughts on paper or to express themselves very well. Uh, they can uh, be manipulative sometimes because they are very verbally precocious. <laughs> Uh, they can be argumentative or it comes over as being argumentative at times. Um, so those are just some of the things that, that you'll see with students that may have difficulty with social interactions. I think sometimes all of our kids these days are having some difficulty with that after COVID. So um, those are some of the characteristics you may see with a gifted child. You won't see all of these things with a gifted child. I just want to add, you can also see how important a, a cultural understanding is, uh, because just in looking at some of those, if you don't have some idea of their cultural background, you might not recognize that that was a sophisticated sense of humor. Yes. You might just not get in there deep enough, and you might not realize there was a deep connection of what they said right. you know, to their history. So I think that's an important part in trying to really interpret and understand what we're seeing now is. Right. And, you know, being culturally responsive, too, from, from what I have read and thought about recently is that some of the things that we take for granted of the, of the sayings that we say, mm -hmm. we, we may understand things like, I can't even think of one right now, but like if you make your, when you make your bed, you lay in it, that type of thing, mm -hmm. that may be a saying or whatever that, you know, a child from a different country or a different culture, they may not understand. You know, we in the South, we have lots of Local people from you know who come from maybe a different state may not have those same final things, and you have to we well, have to uh, educate you know yeah. on what they mean. So I think that's an important thing that you point out there. I have a question. Yeah, no, no, you go right. Go ahead. Uh, I think I remember this. So when I look at the list, I generally think of positive outcomes or mm -hmm. connotate them. But you could have a very, is it possible you could have a very imaginative student who seeks a negative, connotated outcome? So 
imaginative. Let me make up one. Uh, I might say he stole food, but that child was just being imaginative about how to meet their basic need mm -hmm. or how to be resourceful. Is that possible? I think it's possible. I think all things are possible, you know, but I think it's what we do with how we see those things that changes the trajectory for children and for adults. I, think about it. I know sometimes personally, I mean, I'm kind of like you, there's students just, <laughs> and I have a hard time deciphering. Okay, because I mean, just as a human, you know, like they need to learn respect, they need to yes. learn the social norms. And I think part of my job is to help teach them that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, but I try to, I try to think, can they control this behavior or not? You know, is this something that they're just truly just being mean about it? Or can they physically not control what comes out of their mouth because they have to say it? Is there a difference? Yeah, yes, yes. And so as a teacher, I'm trying to, to take that into consideration, like, okay, they are autistic. This is something. But then on another side, I'm trying to figure out how to teach them that that's not, you know, socially accepted or that's not appropriate to say. Uh, and so sometimes, I mean, I, I struggle with with knowing how to discipline that. Because if they can't help it, they, they can't help it. But I think there's a lot of teachers. I mean, if I was in the classroom teacher, I'd be like, sit down. I'm sure as a principal, you know, you're, you see kids all the time coming in and you're just like, you have to hold them accountable. But how much does their, um, you know, but, but I, I was also going to say too, like, and it kind of goes back to what Dr. Roberts has said, it baffles me sitting here thinking that, like, our twice exceptional students will have their IEP meetings um, and they will you know, you'll have a resource of people, but like there's no gifted representation at that meeting. And I just think, I wonder if I could like throw, according to regulations, I have to be here or like, you, you know, we need gifted representation at that meeting. So do you know, Miss Kathy, do gifted teachers, coordinators, do they go to the IEP meetings of these students? Well, I know that there are districts that, that do invite their, their gifted they person. Do, okay. But um, I believe you know, my SPED friends here can help me. I believe anyone can be invited to those meetings who they feel like would be appropriate, okay. be appropriate to help at those meetings. That's that correct? Maybe I need to ask them to go because sometimes you, they, they're making out a plan for this kid, and I'm thinking, why is he going back into like EBD students? Why is he going back in seclusion? And, you know, and I think. I should be a voice for him. Or I would her. think if it's a student yeah, with yeah. service, it would yeah. be something yeah. that they ask. That's They're so different than like, you know, some of our students, you've got the speech pathologist, you've got the occupational, <laughs> things, like all the people exactly. that are really, that's, that's, that's why I think, why have I not sure have the opportunity to do that? That's, but that's probably a message we should share. Yeah. Because if you wonder about it, across the state, people probably are not inviting themselves yeah. to two week IEP meetings. All right, so let's talk about uh, identification best practices. So uh, like we looked at before in the regulation, we need to be screening uh, all students, uh, at least one grade level, say your fourth grade students, all of the you know, you need to, districts need to decide their policies and procedures, you know, how they're going to go about screening students, what assessments they're going to use, what kind of screening tools they're going to use. Uh, but at least one grade level. Um, if possible, it would be, be a good idea to screen them more often than that. Maybe, you know, at uh, changes to um, levels from like, you know, elementary to middle and middle to high school, ensure you haven't missed any students. But I know that um, that could be very time consuming, that type of thing, uh, but it would, you know, make the playing field more equitable for everybody to make sure that we have an ST students. We want to choose assessments that don't uh, create barriers when we're uh, screening students. And so, again, you could be using those nonverbal assessments if you're going to look at cognitive uh, assessment of students. Um, you want to, again, pr provide accommodations that are on the student's IEP. And you also want to gather multiple evidence. You don't want to just use one piece of data to help you uh, and your committee decide if that student should be 
uh, meets the criteria or you need to use some special considerations for that student to be identified as a gifted student. Uh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that is so important to have multiple evidences. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, a value to evaluate the type of uh, evidence that's being provided? In other words, are there some forms of evidence that's more powerful than others or should have a higher ranking? Not according to the regulation. And our regulation does say that we need to be taking multiple sources of evidence, looking at kind of that whole child approach. And then when you look at the regulation, Brent, I can send that to you in section three. It has um, you know, criteria for the five different categories. Uh, but it also says may include, you'll see after there's like a paragraph, and it'll also say may include these other things as well. So it's a district decision by looking at the regulation and deciding, you know, what evidence that you're going to you're going to collect. And then all of that evidence needs to be reviewed and discussed by your GT selection placement committee. I think that's really important. It's like the ARC committee is for the SPEC community. It needs to be looked at by that committee of people. And uh, I believe it's definition 17 in section one that kind of lists out those members, but then it also says other, uh, you know, staff is appropriate. To that effect. So it's really important that a whole team look at that child and <laughs> have discussions about that child. Then when we're assessing them formally for those five areas, again, it's important to provide accommodations for those students, be looking for discrepancies on assessment subtests. So like Dr. Robert said, often uh, students who aren't had an IEP, they've already taken assessments. And so those school counselors you need to help them understand that if you've got a student who's got really high verbal scores, but their word processing or their processing score is, is lower than that, that might be a discrep discrepancy that might be a flag that we need to look at those students. Um, again, providing those nonverbal assessments when appropriate. Uh, also with our students who maybe are gifted in music or drama or dance or visual, uh, no, visual art, we need to give those students opportunities to show us that they can shine. I know as a music student myself, I hadn't had a whole lot of opportunities to have uh, uh, understand the audition process. And so when I went to audition for governor school many, many years ago, it was very daunting. But fortunately, I had some voice lessons before I went, and that really helped me a lot. But I don't think if I had that preparation or if my parents had the money to give me that preparation, I might have not done as well as I did. So I think it's really important that students understand that the process for auditioning and the parts that are going to take place for any type of auditions. And we need to give, do that, like it said in our art, that one article we read uh, that Dr. Robertson has, we need to be front-loading, giving children those opportunities to show us what they can do. If they don't have the opportunity to show us what they can do, then we never may see them or the gifts and talents that they may have. And then we need to train and communicate with our staff and our GT selection placement committee regarding special considerations. And those are those things that we talked earlier about that a student you consider once you gather all the criteria, there can be exceptions to the criteria and the regulation based on a student's disability or their uh, cultural things that may be going on, they are disadvantaged or they're or a child that's underachieving. So how can we uh, support 2E students? So these are four key things that we should be thinking about. Um, we need to have a nurturing environment. I think that's important for all students, right? Every child, every day. But also for our students, you might be uh, 2E because here you've got a child who could be very bright or very gifted in an area and yet they're struggling in another area. And those two things may be just incomprehensible to a child. You know, I don't understand I'm supposed to be very bright, and yet I'm struggling with these things over here. Um, learning strategies, we need to have strategies that, to help that child um, be successful. Let's say, you know, you have a child who's a really great storyteller, but they have just really a lot of trouble getting their thoughts down on paper. Their handwriting is not great. So maybe we could provide them with some sort of word processor or uh, a parent educator that would help to dictate whatever those thoughts are for that child. Uh, social emotional support. We talked about it. it's just important for every every child these days. Um, but again, it's it's really helpful um, to have someone that's aware 
of that child to help them be aware of themselves and to understand those needs, to help them understand that, yes, you can be bright, but you can still struggle. And I think gifted children in general sometimes have that, um, that mindset of, you know, uh, I'm supposed to be gifted, I should be gifted in all things, which we know, you know, is not necessarily true. Why am I struggling over here? Or, or educators may think that, you know, you've identified this child as gifted, so why, why is their behavior not being so great over here? And then strength-based and intra-based programs and interventions. And so I think that one of my first trips to the National Association for Gifted Children Conference, uh, Temple Brandon was one of the vocal, vocal speakers there, and she's a big proponent of twice exceptional gifted children, children may have disabilities. And uh, someone stepped up to the mic and they said, well, you know, how will I be able to help these children that, that have, you know, these issues, these disabilities? And she said, you just need to get to know the child. And once you get to know that child's interest and their capabilities, she said, then you'll have, I don't know if she said the word carrot or not, but she, she might have, then you have that carrot that you can put out there that, that you can help them reach towards. And uh, she she just really, I, I was really impressed uh, by what she had to say to people at her, uh, her speech, her, her presentation. So, and you then, know, just, just to supply of information, she's going to be coming to Rolling Creek, the library is bringing her in. I don't have the date in my head, but if you went to the Warren County Public Library, she's on the schedule to come in. And I know I talk a lot, but I, I, I would like to add this, um, and it's a compliment to Dr. Roberts, because whenever I first started my gifted endorsement, she was my advisor. Um, I told her, I said, you know, I was never gifted. I was never identified as gifted. I said, I'm not smart enough to teach these kids. And she looked at me and she says, Hannah, they're looking for somebody to love them. And I'm like, I can do that. And that has stuck with me. And I want to thank you for that. But because, I mean, it's intimidating. You know, like, how do you service these? Mm -hmm. and, and I think some teachers might think, you got to have an IQ of 140, this and this. And so, but that just, but when you said that, I, I oftentimes think of what Dr. Roberts had told me. So I just wanted to tell her thank you. That's, That's so true. true. I think all children want somebody to love them, you know. You know? But um, if you've got that knowledge that of what a gifted child looks like or an advanced child looks like, uh, you can help to support that child. And if you've got a child that's on both continuums, you know, a child that needs support, but a child who also needs support for their gifts and talents, that, that's, I think, that's even more challenging than that. So thanks for, for that. Because I definitely was not the smartest person in the classroom when I was teaching either. And um, so that, that's practices for collaboration. So this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that special education and gifted teachers could work together to provide services for students. And I know that can be really uh, challenging at times. I was talking with a special educator yesterday and she's like, well, you know, I would like to know more about how we can have those minutes for the student in the IEP and also have time for them to have their services from their gifted student service plan. So it's very challenging for those schedules, I think, for people to meet the needs of, you know, our high potential children and our students with disabilities. Uh, the GT teacher coordinator could, could be invited to, like we we're talking about the ARC, you know, that's a possibility. And then special education teachers could be members of the GT selection and placement committee. So it's really important if you're going to be talking about, you know, your students with disabilities and your, your students who are disadvantaged to have people who know those students who you can talk to them about, about the uh, evidence that's been gathered for those students. So there's just, just some parting thoughts. So these are some five, uh, twice exceptional people. And do you know any of these twice exceptional people? James Jones. Yes. Robin Williams. Yeah. Thomas Edison. So these are all uh, people who had a disability of some, uh, one kind or another, uh, but we know them because of their gifts and talents. Uh, James Earl Jones had a speech impediment at high school, uh, he had a drama teacher who really coached him and helped him. So where would we be without James Earl Jones and the Lion King and other things that I can think of, you know. Uh, Stephen Hawking, you know, was a, uh, a student who was a very cognitively smart student, right? But when he got to college, he developed, was it, um, I forget what disease it was, but it 
affected him physically, but not, you know, cognitively. And he's known for, for many of the physics and things that we know. Anyway, where would our world be without twice exceptional people, right? So those are just my thoughts for today. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your thoughts back, your feedback. It's really great. I don't mean to keep adding, but no, we great. just done a study of preschool to be potentially to each um, WKU has the clinical education complex that deals with autism from preschool all the way up through college, and now life skills is transitioning those students into employment. And so out of the big red schoolhouse, which is for the littlest kids, Ed Schaefer, who is the teacher there, got a very small grant from $10,000. I mean, not a big grant at all. But to look for children who are potentially to aid and then did a program with them on four Saturdays and we at the Center for Gifted Studies saw that as an opportunity to do some qualitative research with parents of these children. I think no one else anywhere is dealing with the potential of uh, Dewey children. And we saw what you see all the way up with the frustration that parents have with twice exceptional children. Um, and those children are so frustrated because here I do really well and here I don't do well at all. And I just think we've got to think across the gamut when we're doing this. And the more we could do to educate parents of young children about the potential is, is pretty exciting. Yeah. It's, it's an apt territory. And if anyone knows of any literature on twice exceptional children in the early years, let me know. Dr. Roberts, I think that's, that's really adds to our conversation today. So thank you. Any other comments or questions or concerns? Um, we're going to break for lunch. And so I've got about, uh, about 11.50. So we'll come back at about 12.50, so 10 to 1. Is that good? Yeah. And we'll be uh, talking about after lunch. Yeah. We'll review our priorities that y'all set last time, and then also making recommendations for KDB based on those priorities. Okay. Seriously. Okay. Go so over our priorities that were set for this new school year here. My own. Okay. So, so when, um, oh, <clears throat> here they are, right? Just, they're going to be off the minutes. Sorry. Equ equitable resources across districts. Um, and I wasn't here when you sent these. So as we divide into groups, I think I'll learn more about what, what is meant by each other. Or we can talk about them right now if you want to, Dr. Rob. This is a good time to people to get feedback. So ethical resources across this. I think that was Hannah and Iron's group. Right? Yes. And so you want to talk a little bit about that? Anna? Yes. Um, in, in the perspective that we kind of took, <laughs> Um, and I think he was coming from a much larger district of some sort. Uh, it was making sure that if this middle school had access to this, this, and this, or if they had access to to the money to provide maybe these uh, advanced courses or extracurricular opportunities, that the other middle school um, in the county would also have access to that as well. So not only just equitable as in the student population, but also within the county, within across the school districts. Uh, and then is that a possibility that if one district has more than another, could could it be remanaged or shared or, or, or some sort? That That's kind of the base on how, how we kind of took that. So it's looking at opportunities for students as well as 
resources. Yes. Money for yes. Yeah. So just like the, to have this one middle school or elementary school wouldn't be much like stacked versus this, um, this, this, the other elementary school. So not only the opportunities, the resources. That, so, so it's not really across districts, which is kind of across the state, I guess, but more inside the yes. district in, internally. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. And then educating teachers and parents on identification and recommendations for student showing leadership characteristics. Thanks. Trinity's was part of that group along with Deep. You were part of that group too? Yes. So y'all want to talk about what y'all discussed on that Friday? <laughs> I think a lot of it was um who brings in that was um, yes, 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 she was with us. And I think um, we were looking at that as an area of opportunity to pull more students into GT. And I think we just wanted to make sure that districts fully understood the ability that they have in that area to like have students use more performance sort of metrics that are like portfolio based. So I think it was a little bit like, hey, let's have a bit of a focus on leadership as a gifted identification area because there's a lot of opportunity for us to pull gifted students who show a lot of ability into our programs using that as like a vector um, because there are not as many, I think, barriers too to entry or leadership since it is usually portfolio based. So um, we also said that there was like, not a lot of education about how to apply um, like reading skills for behaviors and things like that. So maybe if you can sort of develop a little bit of information that could go out to districts in some way to make sure that they really are queuing in on how important leadership is as a way to identify more high achieving students. Okay. Then the third one, equitable funding for all socioeconomic geographic person districts. Gene was in that group. Who else was in the funding group? I might have. I don't. I think I was. We were together. Yeah, whatever. We were, we're together. We were together. <laughs> <laughs> together forever. Well, I think her thing was she talked about, and I've heard Gene talk about this before, and she's also communicated to me about this is that in her district, there would be funds for her to be uh, paid. Other funds, so she wouldn't have to be paid out of the GT funds. Right now, the regulation says that 75% of the GT allocation needs to be spent uh, towards hiring staff who can provide uh, direct instructional services. And so that money is used to pay her because she's one of the people in her district that provides those services. But she said she wishes there was more flexibility uh, so that other funds could be used to pay her. So um, there's that, and then also she talked about where where she's located in Arlen, uh, that there's not as many opportunities for students, and she wished there was more flexibility in the in the funding formula for for that as well, so that services could be more opportunities for services could be spent on children. I think that was the gist of it. Like that's right. So that that's kind of what she was talking about there. Does anybody have any idea of the hit, like the fact that it says in the regulation that 75% of gifted funding has to go toward staffing? That cues me that somehow that was an issue in the past. And that, that therefore that piece of legislation, like it has to be there for a reason, right? Is there any? I think that's absolutely the case and I don't remember the scenarios. But if you don't have any person responsible, probably nothing much gets done. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's, well, that might be too big of a can of So may, may I respond to this as someone who wasn't here and wasn't involved? When we set priorities, that's what we talk about for a year. Well, I think that guides our conversations for the year. 
And then from the priorities, we want to, the, the purpose of, of the council is to make recommendations to KDE. But from the priorities, you could make recommendations to KDE about what needs to be done. So, for example, uh, the, the SAC GPD recommends, uh, and if you're looking at resources, you could think about ways that KDE could encourage that or that KDE could encourage districts or there could be training about it. Or, you know, there could be several recommendations maybe that go along with resources uh, for, for districts, that type of thing. Uh, and you may want to look at Y'all may want to talk about, you know, either some qualitative or quantitative data that those are those are along with some of these as well. I know I was looking at the student advisory council to the commissioner. And so they had made some recommendations about safety, I think. It's been a while since I looked at this, but they had looked at some data about how safety and uh, is taken care of in schools or whatever, and they were, had made some recommendations to ADE or the commissioner about that particular thing. So, in a way, one and three would be, um, yes. in my estimation, similar mm -hmm. for recommendations. And two would be stronger if you were looking at identification. And then it said maybe especially in leadership but not limited to leadership. That's proper flexibility that throughout the year. <clears throat> so, if you wanted to edit the priorities, I guess we would need to have a motion for that. We need to have a motion if you want to edit those. So there'd be a motion, a second discussion, and we would edit them and then we would vote again. Oh, and we have a form. We don't have a form. Um, Let me just get in our <laughs> way. <laughs> 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 so we motion, edit, and then table until um, not without a form. We need 10 people to have a form. Uh, oh, well, and our bylaws say that we really shouldn't meet without a form. And I thought we had a form because I was, I was counting somebody that <coughs> anyway, so well, it's not possible to leave the vote until there is a no. no. That's why it's really important to have a forum because it's hard to get it's hard to get any word done. I wasn't here. How did you all define the difference between resources and funding? Well, resources was more internal. The first one's more internal, and it yeah. could be about staff funding, services, which is sometimes. Even course offerings, staffing, I mean, you know, just equitable resources. Like in monitoring, I've heard parents say, well, over on this side of town, we have XX and X. And over this side of town, we don't have XX and X. And I think that's kind of the conversation that went on last okay. time we met. Whereas three was more, uh, I think, more of a regulatory concern, wishing that that 75% could, that the language could be changed in the regulation so that it was more flexible about spending. I like really that one was, yeah, and um, I thought I thought it was like a bigger issue. I thought it was more like pushing for. Like we have had good funding increases. Let's keep driving toward. <laughs> toward that is that. Well, and I don't what I heard was, you know, I wish that the funding formula was was different because all of that money has to be spent on staffing a certified people. That's what I understood, but maybe you, maybe y'all heard something different. Did y'all hear something different from that? Y'all thought it was about the funding and the regulation? So, I don't know, Katie. I, I feel like with the geographic groups, I think that was Miss Kim. She mentioning something about where they were. Is she Eastern Kentucky? Yeah, she was talking about how much like, like going to field trips, going to museums, going to uh, like, con like or symphony orchestra concerts, mm -hmm. like how, like geographically, they can't go there because that might be like a three hour trip versus someone who's just 30 minutes away. And I, I feel like she's five hour trip. Yeah, oh, yes. Seriously. Yeah. So yeah. I, I believe that I remember her talking about the, about that as well. So I don't. And if she could have spent 75% of those funds or if the 
if the regulation wasn't 75%, just like 50%, or maybe there was some sort of, it was written so that districts had some flexibility about that, you know, but that's the way I understood it because they need more of those funds to spend on those gifted kids because other pots of funds, like you were saying, Title I, Title II, Title III, those all have to go towards specific populations of children. And so for gifted children to get that those funds, it has to come from that that's that source of money, which is the GT application. Yeah, yeah. Well, truthfully, Title I and Title II can hear it specifically including gifted kids that have been since 2015. And I think I worried about the fact that people who control those funds in district are pretty much used to doing it in a way unless they're new folks. And if we don't enlighten them as to all of the ways they can be used to identify gifted children, provide services, it's there. We just need to use it. You know, my former fancy teacher. You know that he has that thing. Uh, it's not fame. Oh, I was going to say that's fame. Sorry, I've been the corner by superintendent. So. <laughs> so tell them what you taught in fancy. Um, well, let's see. You remember I do. Oh, absolutely. Um, I taught uh, pop culture class first. Um, and then the, the, the second tier was uh, dystopian literature. Uh, yes. class. So. Yes, it, it was it was incredible. <laughs> it was incredible. I bet no one's asked you that in a while. It's been a few years <laughs> or decades. <laughs> you also you also played the drums. I didn't realize it last Christmas, right? Do, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll provide a little more history about Byron when he was a brand new teacher. Who was his super university supervising teacher? So just to catch up to speed, so we're talking about the priorities that we set in our last meeting, sure. Byron. And uh, Dr. Roberts had some uh, questions. I wondered if we could maybe edit them a little bit, but we don't have a forum. We'll miss them right. Well, we have to have 10 people. So um, we're going to have to table that for next time and maybe edit them a little bit. But I still think we could we still make recommendations. I'm not going to table that. I mean, you know, we could work on but we couldn't. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I was looking at this. It looks like actually we did discuss the leaders, the second one. Mm -hmm. It said, <laughs> Members discuss changing the second priority focus not just on leadership, the other under identified gifted areas that are harder to quantify, uh, quantitatively identify. I do remember having that discussion. Yeah. yeah. So it is in there, but I guess that we didn't. I think we voted. I don't know. I thought we had voted to keep them the way they were or something like that. Or maybe, or maybe we had looked, but we had five posters up and I think we, I can't remember exactly. But I remember that discussion and we really had. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I think we're going to have to table the running of the recommendations and all that from February. And so, um, sorry about that, but we'll just have to table that for next time. And I think everybody said that they thought they could make that better at the table right now. Uh, can make the February 6th meeting, right? So that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And Jean felt really bad, badly when. Uh, I had to her yesterday that she couldn't be here, but they had another thing going on at school. She couldn't get away with that face. And Mason will help. We just need to make sure we have a, a form. Do you, so we'll get back to that in a minute. Thank you. Get back. Well, maybe we should do it now. It's not really part. It's on the agenda to talk about future meetings. So, so. so we'll just move on. Okay. All right. So the next thing we're going to table priorities. And writing of the recommendations. And we're going to have a cage update, and Dr. Roberts is going to do that for Dr. Middleton because she could not be here today. Let me tell you a couple of things about Cage. Cage had the opportunity <laughs> to speak before the Joint um, Education Commission 
<laughs> over. And um, Allison Gefford, the executive director of CAGE. And um, a, a, a grown up gifted student uh, who was, okay, and, and I were the three who, who, who talked there. And the truth of the matter is the message that we're trying to convey is that these are the kids who are going to have a great deal to do with the STEM economy that our nation needs and that the Commonwealth needs. I don't know if any of you drive on I-65 like I do to get here, but there, what do you see, Byron, when you come along there that gets your attention? The, the massive Ford uh, factory. Yeah, the electric battery plant that is huge. Absolutely huge. And you think of the people that it will take to operate that. We're talking about high level folks. And please look at the data we've got on our science achievement out of the last test. I mean, it's it's shocking, but we don't have the people who are being prepared to, to work at the high level in the numbers that we'll need. And that's not the only electric battery plant. Boeing Green has one going up. And, and the industry that is coming in is requiring high level knowledge. So, um, Cage is going to be going forward uh, with a request of 24 million gifted education. And that is simply looking at paying the salary completely of one person per district plus half again as much. And I think all of you know that in the last session, uh, we went from where we had been for 30 years at 7 million to 10 million. And I think each of us needs to thank those in the legislature who made that happen. But that's not enough. If we're going to support the kids who absolutely are being neglected in many school districts, not in all, but in many school districts, they're um, not receiving the advanced learning opportunities that they need. So that's one thing CAGE is doing. The second thing is the CAGE conference is coming up in uh, February. And the dates, and, the, and it, it was in the report from the last time, but the dates are the 26th and 27th of February. The keynotes, um, the first one is uh, Kristen, H-E-N-G-T-G-E-N. You say it. <laughs> I can spell it. You say it. Um, from the Education Trust, and uh, they're issuing a report on Kentucky soon, and there will be an op-ed piece coming out of that that I'll probably be the primary author of. Um, that we need advanced coursework. We need to be taking kids into advanced coursework and. Obviously, you know, I'm interested in your folders. You, you've got the report that we directed you to online. And um, this isn't a cage thing, it's a center thing, but Jonathan Flucker is coming the last, uh, on November 30th to WKU to do a report on how do we implement this report. He, he was one of the working group that was in it. Uh, so if that is the first keynote, the last keynote is going to be uh, a Kentuckian one that uh, we know quite well. Justin Mitchell is going to do the last one on creativity. So we will start the conference with a keynote and we will end the conference with a keynote. Not two morning keynotes, but the beginning and the end of the two days. Um, 
questions on the cage contract? <clears throat> Hope you'll come. I remember the day that the funds were with the council to support council members going to get to the funds. But that's <coughs> very fun. Where did that money come from? It when it was funded, it came from the state. There was money for doing things other than meeting, and that probably stopped or four years ago, not, yeah. not much more than that. But we could do projects, we could. Uh, well, I print reports. Mm -hmm. and handbooks and flyers and brochures. That was important. Well, that's the cage report, the funding and the cage conference. Um, Moving on to the National Gifted Education. I would be happy to talk about <laughs> uh, The National Association for Gifted Children just completed its conference in Orlando. It was back to numbers as good as 2015. So that, that, that's a good sign. Um, Kentucky was well represented. Um, but as I mentioned this morning, there are a couple of national organizations that one is TAG, the, the Association for the Gifted, the, mm -hmm. uh, the Division of the Council for Exceptional Children. And through that organization, we are at the end of uh, updating the initial standards for teachers and the former standards had a 2013 date on it. And uh, our new standards have been uh, to the K board and approved by them. We have just a couple of tweaks to make and, and that will be new. And I would tell you that that has been a two and a half year process, not easy. But I think that's important. Having Standards for your field is important. And all of you, I'm sure, know about the programming standards. These are different. These are the standards to define what teachers of, of gifted and talented students need to know and be able to do. So, what else is going on at the national level? Um, much of the discussion is to be on equity so that young people, no matter what their circumstances, have every opportunity to develop. And I always want to relate that back to what we in Kentucky are doing with the primary talent pool. I worry that it's in name only in many districts. And if that's true, then there is no opportunity for our K-1, 2, 3 children who come from lower income families where they have not had the rich vocabulary developing before they come to school to have that opportunity prior to the opportunity to be identified in fourth grade. Um, I hope that's what's true in all districts, but I am suspicious that that's true in many districts. And if all of you would remember 1990, which is a long time ago, but that's where the primary talent pool came to be because we were doing a primary program and K-123 would provide the opportunity for children to matriculate in their learning, get out sooner or stay longer based on what, what it was they needed to be. And for that to be the time that there would be rich opportunities for the upper quartile to ensure the fact that they had every opportunity to thrive. 
So maybe someone else knows what's going on nationally that they'd like to add to that. I know. Um, so I'm part of the Council for State Directors uh, Gifted Programs, and we had a virtual conference, and one day was before the uh, national conference in Orlando. That was a face-to-face -face conference. I did a face-to-face -face day. I was able to attend that, but I did attend the three virtual days. And some of the things that we, uh, that I remember that came to the forefront was the president of the National Association talked about that there was going to be kind of a focus on pre-service teachers. Because as we talked about earlier, high potential students, advanced students, they are advanced 30 minutes once a week. You know, they need those supports all the time. And so uh, they're hoping to have um, some training or a focus on pre-service teachers and gifted education in regular classroom is what I heard from uh, Mr. Knight. Sheila Gallagher is president right. of NHEC. And from the podium, she recommended that every teacher would have a three hour course in gifted ed much like they would in special education moving on. So that's down your alley of Byron. And I think there is something in our certification that would require way more preparation on gifted than is happening in most of our colleges of teacher ed. Well, there certainly wasn't. I mean, there was none on gifted and for special education. I had one class, which was also not enough to adequately prepare you for that. But class. you probably so, mean what not, I mean, one 30 minute period or three hour class. You don't mean a, a, a course all semester. No, I had a one semester or one, yeah, one, you know, three hour credit course for special ed. I had nothing for gifted ed, but neither would be, <laughs> neither is acceptable. If one is not enough for special ed either. And uh, we, we also had, a, we had two special speakers. The second speaker was uh, Dr. Tamara uh, uh, Stanball, who um, is from Appalachia, but is now, at least she's working in Washington State. But um, she talked about that as we talk about equity and we talk about diversity and identifying students, that there's really not a silver bullet for that. There was somebody making a lot of money, uh, but they, uh, through some other research she's talked about, she talked about the CASA, uh, which is a critical overview, and she talked about that we have to be thinking about cost, alignment, and sensitivity access. Um, and so cost being, you know, it costs a lot for us to assess students, either screen them or give them formal assessments. And, and she talked about it would be, it would be good if districts had the opportunity to use the assessments they already have in the district. Uh, because that would mean less costs for the district to have to purchase those types of things. That's one thing that they talked about. And also alignment to whatever the student was being assessed for. Like if you have a student that you're going to refer for language arts, you wouldn't give them a creativity assessment, right? Or you wouldn't give them just a cognitive ability assessment, which some districts unfortunately still think that if you give somebody a general intellectual ability test, that should mean that they're uh, identified for all of the academic areas. And so um, those of us in, the, in, in gifted education understand that just because you're cognitively gifted doesn't mean you're necessarily passionate about language arts or science or social studies or science, right? Um, also, um, so those things that access just uh, we need to have an intensity and dose of service. So um, I don't remember exactly what you talked about there, but that was the Kind of the cost of the acronym there, cost alignment, sensitivity, and access. I guess access would be to uh, identification or screening. But if we only let parents or grandparents or whoever refer students, then we're going to be missing students if we're not doing a universal type of screening. And uh, you talked about uh, building versus just national norms, because sometimes when you only use our, our district norms, when you only uh, these dorms across your districts and you're not looking specifically in your buildings, you're going to be missing children too. Because those, those district norms may not necessarily represent the students that are in your building. So you may miss, be missing some high flyers that way. We had, we had three days of really good discussion. Um, we, I, I think we had probably about 40 participants, 24 states. And uh, there are states who 
or having like an automatic enrollment of students into their higher coursework in, in high school. So if you make a certain score on a state assessment, they automatically enroll you into higher coursework and parents can opt out if they want to, you know, uh, but that's kind of an interesting concept. Those are some of the things that we talked about in the Council for State Directors. The last thing that you've talked about, the automatic enrollment, mm -hmm. North Carolina has been doing some great work and they've had legislation and they've been doing it long enough that it makes a difference. But they say from third grade up, if you show that you're working at the advanced level, you'll have advanced instruction. And just think of the difference that is but being in a fourth grade class that's heterogeneously grouped. And the data on that, if it's in reading fourth grade, you've got kids who are non-readers probably up to kids who are reading at the high school level. And we expect a teacher to be challenging each of those students to be learning every day in school. Well, how ridiculous is that? Which is also why if you are doing research on differentiation, not much is happening any place in regard to it. That's too difficult. You've got to get kids in clusters. And if you look at math, and there's a recent study looking, I think, at fifth grade math, you've got that same spread. Well, what about the kids who caught on to the math quickly and they're still doing the same math that is being used to get kids up to proficient. Do you see the problem? Mm -hmm. How do we get schools to be grouping and regrouping? And I am very interested in Kentucky looking at automatically putting kids into advanced math coursework. At least, you know, I, the report, and you've read it, it's one of the advanced uh, courses will be at middle school doing algebra and without the opportunity to do that, you almost don't have the chance for that child to be doing the kind of math they need to do to do well in um, so automatic enrollment in math. I think offer some promise for us like it has for North Carolina. I think the state of Washington has also been doing that. And so if you don't want your child to stay in that advanced class, you've got to speak up to opt out. That's far more likely the child will stay in it than if you or Kirk or anyone else has to opt into that class. Um, yep, that's something I couldn't be more interested in than I am in that right now. I was blessed. I was uh, the school. My daughter, she started out early in math, and then, and then by the time she got to seventh, sixth grade, they she was two years, one to two years, I think, two, and they started. They had to bus to take her to a different school. It's the same district. And they would take her over there and do the, you know, the high school math or whatever she was doing um, at that at that level. But uh, I know. But when my older son uh, was trying to get into algebra early, I think it was one point from whatever their test score was that they used to determine whether the kids could take algebra in eighth grade. And I was disappointed that that was the only factor that they would use, you know, especially a child just one point. You know, he was so smart and all that, you know, his scores. And anyway. Um, so I started taking him to other school, uh, colleges to try to see if I could get him into a college class where he could get the college. Uh, uh, of course, I thought he was qualified and, and needed that challenge, but a lot of schools weren't offering it at that time. So uh, so now I think he would have a better chance of doing that, but at that time they were. <laughs> We've got to be voices for kids doing mm -hmm. the work they're ready to do. And I presume that you all looked at the, the, the data that was in the, the, the one report that I tested. And we should talk about that too. That's, that's part of this. this okay, let's do that. Okay. Do we have something before we do that? 
No, it was it's part of this section here, the National Gifted Education Report. So that's what these are. These are national reports, but I think it's go ahead, Frank. Thank you for the talk about it. Thank you before I lose it. Yeah. Um, just one more note, the NAGC is having a teacher summit in February. Uh, it's going to be virtual February 13th, and they're having a call now for proposals, and that's due by November 27th. Right around the corner. Yes. <laughs> okay, so last June, this report was released. Has that approved? Here's an extra poll for all. Yeah. Here's an oh, yeah. extra poll. Oh, oh, I think. Is this yeah. the same? It is. At least you could add your own, very own copy. Yeah. <laughs> you only knew how uh, <laughs> I'm so electronically <laughs> driven. <laughs> so let's do the other report first because it kind of sent out copies of that. What were your thoughts? It was one of the links that we sent, and it was uh, really looking at um, the data for various groups. It's, it's looking at the excellence gap, and the excellence gap is looking at the advanced performance students by various groups and the gaps are huge. The truth of the matter is nobody's doing exceptionally well, except there are a lot of gaps. Oh, this is going to sound maybe silly. Right in that first paragraph, it says that uh, uh, the most lucrative jobs often go to those who perform at the highest levels. And I thought to myself, you know, I really hadn't thought about that before. You were talking about the, the battery cell plant that's, that's going to be forthcoming and how we need people to be in those jobs. And, you know, that's a barrier. If you don't have the education or skills that you need to uh, apply for those jobs, then that, that's keeping you and your family at the same level. And that could be a generational poverty thing, you know. That was the first thing that hit me that I, I should have thought about that before, I guess, but it just kind of hit me that when children don't have opportunities, they, they, they can't move forward. Families can move forward. Well, it was kind of interesting in, in, when you look at the gaps with, with the different races and the social economic status with the enrollment for Harvard that I just assume that it's 2023. We're making advances from growing it. And it showed the data, I think, of 20 years ago that the, uh, the, the one population, uh, the, there was no increase to that whatsoever. And I just, I kind of thought, I, I just assumed there would be. And I, I forget exactly which population that was, but I think it was the Asian. So it's the Asian that, oh, it's. Um, even though they were, it hasn't the, listed the black. It just says, yeah. But, but even, but, but there, there wasn't a great increase really yeah. overall. But I was, like, yeah, it went like from one to one or so. Yes, so yeah, something low, but yeah. But when you look at the progress that people make and that you read about, yeah, it's like, why isn't that reflected? In yeah, I'm like, just assuming we would be further along there. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're not with the advancement there. I have to admit, I was a surprise, <laughs> even though, you know, sometimes I get drenched in, you know, dealing with inequity and, and I, 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 I'm i guilty. You know, I think we all might have uh, some blinders on in some respects. And I got to admit, that was a blinder for me that uh, Asian people were being discriminated against in that regard. Because you always just read about how well they're doing it. When you look at the test scores, they're usually at the top. I never thought that they were being discriminated, you know, kept out, even though they deserve to be there. I, and that a school like Harvard would be guilty of that. And uh, so I thought that was interesting to see that sometimes you grow up and you're kind of thinking that, oh, they're just prejudiced against my race. 
you know, and maybe somebody else thinks they're just prejudiced against their race or their gender. You know, a lot of women, I think, had a hard time getting in. And now we see that it's not that they didn't deserve to be or they didn't think that they were good enough, clearly qualified, but it is the schools either just looking at the green and the money that could be brought into their schools or they, you know, deliberately trying to leave out certain races so that they don't get over what they think is should be the best. And I just never, ever would have thought that was happening. But it was, it was very enlightening. Thank you. What, what other bits did you glean from those data? It came today, and I read it this morning. It's in today's, if you get the NAGC yeah. news source. So, uh, Florida Institute has an article about grading standards and student effort. And I'm trying to find the link because I don't, I've never heard the phrase before. Uh, the idea, uh, it's called a gap. Uh, the idea is parents are more familiar with ABCD grades, but and those grades are being inflated, especially now post pandemic. But when you look at national test data, our, our student test scores across the country are going down, but parents don't see that because their children are making A's. It talked about that that was the article today talked about, uh, it's from the Brookings Institute, uh, talked about parents don't see that, and they don't see the absenteeism that we all uh, lived through during uh, online uh, teaching and learning, you know, kids wouldn't show up. You didn't have a good idea about why they didn't show up or where they were. Uh, so I, in my head, I connected this reading with that reading this morning. And that went, the idea that parents have this, my child is learning, my child is improving because they're making an A. Uh, the assertion was we're doing a disservice economically disadvantaged students by taking in late work, by inflating grades, uh, because there's there's no difference post-pandemic to pre-pandemic, but there's also not that speaking up by parents. They're not recognizing parents don't typically understand when we do identification or screening. Parents don't typically understand even what proficiency means or distinguished. Um, it was, in my crazy way of thinking, it went right along with that. I, th I think it did. And it's about the same. Uh, it's the results from the data you were talking about from North Carolina. Yes, no, it's yeah. all about North Carolina. Who should be reading this report? And I'm talking about building the wider board first pipeline of advanced learnings. I think it's kind of divided when I looked at it between state administrators and also people in the districts. You know, there's a whole section devoted to what those of us, the state need to be thinking about focusing on them. But then there's also a whole section about districts and local ed education agencies. So I might like generalize to that to say decision maker. I was just going to say administrators, this, these are not decisions I get to make, you know, like a lot of things that are covered here. So I think absolutely like legislators, your state board of education, your commissioner, your local administrators, your superintendents, your principals, like by the time this stuff trickles down to me, it's I've already been told that I can and can't do like. So if this is important, how do we get it out to those groups? Perhaps you know that for years we've been doing the proof of administrators, superintendents specifically, who voluntarily become a member of the Victoria Fellows. And we bring them to WKU for two or three meetings during the year. And our first meeting is November 30th. And Jonathan Buckler is there with this report. Please know your superintendent could be in that group. All they have to do is say they want to be. 
last year, I hosted a symposium for about 40 people in the state on advanced coursework. This isn't a new interest of mine. I think it's something we we're going to fall behind if we're not doing it. And those people have been invited to November 30th. But anyone can get on and register to come to that particular meeting. And Jonathan is a friend, but he was in that work group. It's in an important place. That's something that affects people. I'll statewide. be glad to. I just think, and, and the preacher committee's interested in it. I'm involved there too, but it's important for people to realize we our standards, our, our ranking has fallen in in various ways, and we can't do that. We've got Kentucky's got to be better than that. But we've got to be advocates. And this report just happened to come out at a time that it's current. So and we just need to do a better job overall about communicating with parents and with educators, building relationships. I think Kirk's right that if my child brings home A's, I think all's well with the world. About, it, they're calling it the urgency gap. So right, we had all this ESSER funding. ESSER funding has to be committed to 2024 and completely spent down by 2025. But all of the interventions we're providing, uh, districts are having a tough time right now as the tide is starting to turn, right? So we have a lot of teacher absences. We have a lot of classroom teacher vacancies. And so those intervention programs are getting a slow start those children are just getting further and further behind. And so, you know, uh, as a local school board member, you might get a briefing a school, before a school board meeting and you might get a really nice and done public presentation, but maybe we should also consider partnering or somehow uh, with KSBA uh, and having asking if we could uh, have just one workshop session on on advanced education in general. Uh, my, I was doodling over here. When you said math, my first thought was lower class guys, more money to spend on personnel. And not because I'm not an advocate. 25 years ago, I had a wonderful college professor who helped me get my gifted endorsement. <laughs> But that's exactly what I thought about in today's time. I don't um, even think we need fewer kids. We just need to cluster kids yeah. so they can be taught at the level they're ready to learn yeah. and not have a heterogeneous group of kids. You just think of the full range. It's almost, I mean, I teach kindergarten, so I'm getting elected to ground level and already the gap from my lowest student to my highest is massive and it's their first year of school for most of them. I mean, you have kids that don't even recognize their name in print or know how to spell it to kids who are ready to read or are already reading. I mean, that's a massive gap and that's your one. That's only going to like increase by the time you get to upper elementary and on to middle school and stuff like it's, and it is sometimes very difficult to teach my standards teach to, you know, like what I'm supposed to be teaching and then catch these kids up and then challenge these kids. And it's, it's a lot. I mean, it's very difficult to balance all that. And I'm sure you're doing it, but you'd love to talk to Patrice McCrary because that's what she did. <laughs> did it. Well, like I'm sure you are. I try. I don't know. Some days it doesn't feel so well, but I've heard that too. I mean, it's it just an increase from almost the has to have not as far as education. It's just really there's a big divide there. And the social emotional needs aren't making it any either easier either. The, the societal shifts and then like the COVID effect of things, like there's just a lot at play. Like there's not as much parenting as there used to be. And then COVID, I think, made the absentee is the chronic absentee of it 
absenteeism even worse. And there is no urgency. <laughs> like yeah. the parents don't feel an urgency. Even five-year-old kids don't feel an urgency to like push on and do hard things. And it's a lot. There's a lot of factors. I think that's because parents are just are so still tired from COVID yes. and trying to monitor what I think that's on. some of it. I think a lot of it is really just like a societal thing. Like and this may not be true in all areas, but we just run into a lot of like schools, not their priority, like their travel baseball team is their priority or mm -hmm. their, you know, their Xbox is their priority. I mean, and that's not, not everyone, of course, right. but more and more every year I've taught, like it just school is, yeah, it's school, like it's, it's, it's not like focus. parents don't, are not as empowered to take risks for their children in terms of setting ground rules for them, setting boundaries um, for their students. Um, as a parent of uh, two middle schoolers and an upper elementary student, I'm very cognizant of how their activities and their academic have to play against each other or in conjunction with each other, but also to what extent do my expectations affect their um, social emotional health. And I was listening to the radio um, about how what, um, an actress was uh, talking about her child, about um, she had no idea that her child felt the pressure that she, uh, from, from her, um, because she just had high expectations for the child without it. And it was just not part of their view as a parent. And so as parents, I think it is, it, it is tiring. It's scary. Um, and I think as teachers, it's overwhelming because you're trying to educate the child in your classroom while educating these parents. And especially for parents who don't work during a time when they can meet with teachers or they don't have the capacity to, to visit the school as often as parents who do have cars visit the school. There's a lot of those gears that are moving all the time that I think a lot of parents are just trying to survive. And if their kids are breathing and somehow getting up every day and going to school, that's survival. Um, but I appreciate Kirk your comment about the urgency, the urgency gap. Yeah, and I'm sitting here listening to you. Um, the urgency comes from parents look at grades on a report oh, yeah. because that's the language mm -hmm. that they know. They don't under so we as professionals need to create the urgency. Yes, and parents and need parents yeah. need to understand that's right. what their children are learning. Well, and it seems like we're trying, even as an educator, in my personal experience with my children at their schools, I'm trying to read between the lines between their A's and they're missing work, but they're getting, you know, they're, they have the opportunity to make up the work. Well, what does that mean for my child? Are they understanding it? Do they need to be retaught? What does that mean as a whole? And that's why, and I, and I initiated a, a parent teacher conference because I wanted more explanation. So, but I'm an educator and I still feel like I'm reading in between the lines because I know some of the accommodations that I make for my students who don't turn in their work. And I know I'm, I'm compelled to tell my children's teachers, don't sugarcoat anything for me. I would love to see high expectations for my own children. Um, but at the same time, I understand that there are things that teachers feel like they need to do to accommodate a whole child. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really, I feel like it's a guessing game and I'm tired of guessing as a parent and and just surviving as a teacher in the classroom and trying to bring home and school together. It's it's daunting. It's so much of what you would just say, uh, 
And you also about uh, COVID, yeah, what happened before, what was going on before COVID, where people sometimes put sports ahead of oh, yeah. uh, some of the things going on with the schoolwork and the urgency of that. Um, but I just went on a, a little tour with Pritchard, uh, some of the, uh, Bridget Bloom, the uh, executive director of that, or CEO. Uh, we went to Carter County and did a tour of, this, of some of the schools there. And, and it seems like it was the superintendent, Dr. Green, who pointed out some of that uh, dismay maybe uh, came from when uh, they were in school, when they went back to school, if one kid sneezed or something, then so many other kids had to take off because they were in contact. I mean, not just sneezed. If they found out they had COVID, you know, and they sneezed or something like that, then other kids were required or highly recommended to not come for like 10 days. So, and then they, they go and get called up and come back and then if it happened again. So you had this sort of routine of people missing at uh, large days. So then if you, if you miss 10 days and get called up and come back and do it again, you start thinking, well, gosh, if my child was in one day, you know, it it uh, it somehow makes you makes you think that maybe that attendance is not as important as we were taught to believe because they did just fine when they got they got called up and they uh, some of them some of them okay that's that's a whole nother yeah yeah some of them <laughs> that intervention yeah we okay. oh, and there's one other great uh, hard thing that is a challenge for our kids is that an A with no challenge. Yes. doesn't mean the same thing as an A if you've been working hard on assignments that require you to work hard to achieve it. And so we get underachievement for many of our really bright kids. So. And I can see like my administrators maybe at the high school level, if I were to go to them asking them for, and, and I need to, like, it's, all, it's a convicting message here. And I don't know about you all, but I just feel heavy. Because I'm like, what what can I do? What can I go home and do tomorrow and get something started? Um, but it's talking about the GPA, you know, a lot of your advanced GT kids at the high school, they will not take those AP classes because it will affect their GPA, which will affect their keys money, which will affect their status. But it doesn't affect their keys money much. Right. If you look at the take your CP far better off to take a tough class and get a yeah. B than. And going back to what Mr. Kirk said, it's like we're dealing with that as with the, oh, we get parent emails. Well, my kid has got all A's. Uh, I think they should be in the gifted program or they've got a proficient and distinguished. And that's great. But when you look at that with the stay nine, and I guess I'm just on my soapbox and I don't understand how like the state of Kentucky, we can't even use their end of the year assessments for gifted identification. And I just think, how, how, how is that? Like, it's a, regulation, it's a regulation thing. But the, the like state assessment not, is criteria in reference. It's okay. not a nationally normed assessment. So is there is that a possibility of Kentucky ever going? You'd have to look at the regulation. Okay. See, I don't know enough about that to know, but it just blows my mind. I think what we are assessing our kids. And we you can use it to find kids. Right. 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 To help you screen. Yeah. And to further evaluate, collect evidence. Yeah. I just, I was just shocked. I'm thinking it's, it's, you know, nationally, how does that, but, but anyway, I don't know. It's just compelling conversation. Right. That goes back to camera sandbox. Think about using assessments that you already have to help you. Yes. 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 I don't know. Anyway, these are really good, good conversations. You guys, we're almost, we're, we're at 201. So I think that you should maybe continue these on in February and do you have any closing remarks? Well, I'd like to say if anyone thinks about this and wants to do something more, email me. Because I don't think this is wait a few months and wait a few months. I think it's kind of what we ought to be doing to move Kentucky forward. Um, I appreciate each of you being here and I do hope each of you will Put on your calendars with red or red on your computer to make sure that the February meeting is one that we get to. And if you see any other members of the group, urge them to be there as well. 
this is such important work and the things that we have talked about will not happen here. They will happen in your schools and in your school districts. And each of us has connections within our schools, our districts, our communities. And uh, if you have any close ties with legislators, I'd love to know it. This is a budget year. Right, so thank you for coming. Um, and check out the other stuff in your folder. And if you have questions about opportunities, I'm always happy to talk about it. Our next meeting is uh, February the 6th. So make sure you circle that. And the meeting after that is April 17th. So uh, the year will be over. <laughs> and February 6th is probably KBE meeting on the 6th, too. Just FYI. I'm sorry. There's a KBE meeting on the 6th. Yeah. 6th and 7th, I believe, of February. So just, just FYI. What are those days, Byron? Uh, it's. February 6th and 7th, is that what you said? Yeah. Or what? KBE, Kentucky Board of Education. Yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday. I think the reason we were having on the 6th is because the uh, gifted proclamation. Oh, yeah, that's and true. Up and some of us from the. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, it's here nor there for me. I'm just saying FYI, if you were yeah, planning on this. using the, uh, mm -hmm. um, they've gone to starting though. The Tuesday is the afternoon session and Wednesday is the morning session. So they okay. spread it into two days now. Well, this is a good brand to use, I think, for our purposes. So if we could need a state board room, we could do this. Yeah, room. sure. Um, and the February meeting is in person, correct? Yes. And we can't make any motions or change that. Well, I don't think you have to have a motion or anything. I think, I think the chair can decide if she wants that to be hybrid or not. But we do need to have at least 10 people or a convened meeting. And I had 10 confirmations today. So that was my only thing. Like, I just wondered if it would be worth switching it to a hybrid in the hopes that we could at least get a quorum and nothing else, weather and stuff. Although we'll be fine. Yeah. 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 Ye